Okay, uh, our next speaker is Nicole Morrill from Magellan Asset Management, who's going to give us an update on uh, international matters, uh, as well as um, uh, the infrastructure investments that we've been investing in recently. Just to introduce Nicole, she joined Magellan in 2014, having commenced her career in finance and funds management industry in Australia in 1995. Prior to Magellan, Nic Nicole worked, oh, sorry, held the position of investment specialist with Perennial Investment Partners for more than seven years. And then before joining Perennial, Nicole was the state sales manager in Queensland for Kaplan, a leading education company in the financial services industry. And she has worked in Australian banking for more than eight years. Nicole holds a advanced diploma in financial services in financial planning and lives in Brisbane here with her husband, Dane, and three young children, Xavier, Lulu, and Indy. Can you please welcome me in, uh, join me in welcoming Nicole? Thanks. Thank you and good afternoon. No, good morning. Uh, I have a hard act to follow, I hear. Some of you are serial offenders at this event. and Most of you know uh, Rob Martin. I don't have either an Irish accent or an American accent. Sorry to disappoint you. Um, now, talking about looking around corners, just following on from the fraud presentation at Magellan, that's what we're attempting to do, but look at around corners at what's, what we're facing in terms of investment markets from here. And as many of you know, we are a global investing business. So we're looking at primarily businesses that are um, offshore. So we'll be covering everything this morning from geopolitics to trade to economics and, um, and of course, businesses. And I'm going to slip, um, split the presentation into three parts. The first thing I'll talk about is sort of the big issues and the big, big risks that we're looking at around the world. And then I'll break it down into the broader global equity market and then narrow it down into more specifically investing in, in infrastructure. So let's kick off from here. Um, gee, these slides are big, right? <laughs> I feel... Uh, so the first thing, and, and what I like to do with the presentation of this nature is to start with setting the framework for how we at Magellan think about in, in investing on your behalf. So the first thing that we want to do is protect capital for you. So for every $100 you give us, we want to protect your capital in down markets. Now, I've never had any complaints about that. The question, though, is how do we do that? Um, there's a number of ways by which we, we can do this for you. The first one is that we can hold some cash in our managed fund portfolios that you invest in. So up until recently in the Magellan Global Fund, we've held 20% 20, 20 cash. So for every $100 you've given us, we've put $20 aside on the sidelines for when we think better opportunities will arise. Um, so that's one way. And then I'll just talk to you. And, th and then the other way that we protect, in, in, um, protect your capital is by stepping aside from sort of risks that we see are avoidable. So one good example at the moment would be the uncertainty with um, the UK obviously le leaving or potentially leaving the EU. Um, and because the range of outcomes there are so wide and there's really no certainty on where that will land, we've actually withdrawn our holdings or sold down on the positions we've had in, the, in our global fund. Um, we've previously had Lloyds Bank, so many of you would be familiar with Lloyds largest retail bank in the UK. As, as um, someone indicated, I think a number of you like to travel. So a lot of these global names I'll mention today probably aren't unfamiliar to you. Um, Lloyds Bank and also Tesco, so a retailer in the UK. And that's just because, because of the um, possible outcomes, no one really knows what the decision is going to be and therefore we're unsure of actually where it will land in terms of share prices, which is obviously what we're thinking about. Um, and I guess to take that to another extension, to extend that out, um, in the infrastructure fund, we've actually sold down on water utilities because if there was an, an, um, a federal election and there was a change of government to Corbyn, uh, he has stated that he will nationalise UK water utilities. So they're currently listed stocks on the stock up market. But who knows, if they're, um, if they're taken back to the public space, what price you'll get paid to get for those assets. So let's say the share price of a UK water utility is $10 at the moment, you might get paid $6. That's not great for you as investors. So we just sort of try to stay um, out of the way of those 
those pieces. The other thing we do to protect your um, capital is we, um, we like to avoid sovereign risks. I'll talk you through China a little, and, and more specifically China infrastructure, uh, and, and anything that's highly cyclical. So we know in Australia we have got a lot of exposure to um, energy materials and resources, which can be fantastic investments at times, but can also be quite cyclical. So because a lot of our clients are Australian clients, we tend to sort of carve that piece out because most of you already got enough of that and it doesn't help with our objective of um, sort of mo reducing the swings in share prices from here. So that's the first thing we're trying to do. The second thing we want to do is obviously deliver a decent return. So in the global fund, we will deliver, um, we aim to deliver a 9% return per annum. And we're sort of thinking out here three to five years. And um, in the infrastructure fund, it's around eight because it's a lower risk type of strategy. But I only mention that because of the way we're thinking. Essentially, we're thinking about the risks to protect in down markets. So what are the risks that we've, that um, are we're confronted and we're walking into at the moment as we look at the world um, over the next sort of three to five years. There is always a huge range of them. Um, you know, whether it's geopolitical, whether it's trade tensions, whether it's domestically political, uh, demographics, there's a whole lot of environmental risks, etc. So the interesting thing here, though, is if I've put this up this same slide up for the last seven or ten years, there would have been a whole other list of issues that we face. But the, the equity markets over the last seven and ten years have delivered between 12 and 15 per cent uh, returns. So despite headwinds at times, there can be still good opportunities in investing in businesses from here. Um, and I think all of these risks need to be sort of looked at in context of how sensitive people are to markets, to, um, it, well, how sensitive investors are to um, the current conditions around them. And at the moment, we've just seen a, a big turn by the Fed in the US around the future of interest rates and what they're doing with their balance sheet. And that actually has given a lot of people certainty that it's, that this business cycle and this economic cycle, which we've been seeing run for the last seven to 10 years, um, has still got, a, um, still got some steam left in it. Um, however, at Magellan, we still remain cautious, so I'll step you through, um, step you through that. So what are the two big risks that we're thinking about? So uh, against a list that's as long as can be, um, the two things that we think are important to focus on and, and will definitely have an impact on markets are the US trade tensions, all right, and the second one is what the US is doing with their monetary policy. So, you know, if you're talking about monetary policy at a barbecue, which I hope you don't, that would be what the Fed is doing with interest rates and what they're doing with their balance sheet of bonds, and we've had some changes there. So let's just have a quick chat about what's happening here within, um, with the US-China trade tensions, so to put it into context. Um, Firstly, it shouldn't come as a surprise to any of us that um, trade is being is is an issue of contention for Trump. Many of you would know as he walked through his campaign, he was quite clear about what his objectives were, and one of them was to sort of set the, a level playing field for for trade and business um, globally. And so we've seen him drop the U.S. taxes, their corporate tax rates from you know, 30-odd percent to about 21 percent, literally overnight, the biggest tax cut you've seen in the history of the earth. Um, so that helps US companies become more competitive. But it's very hard to do business if you've got the other largest economy in the world dumping product on the market, which no one else can actually compete with because of the, co the cost of labour and um, the scale of, of what's available in through the Chinese market. So, um, so Trump uh, has went along the lines of dealing with trade tensions with the um, with his allies so we know of you know Japan South Korea um, Canada and Mexico um, the the NAFTA was rewritten and there's been some changes to do with that there but now the big issue that was more of a domestic pol politics issue this is now more of a global uh, a global um, issue that, tr that Trump's thinking about. So many of you would know that the US imports about $500 billion worth of goods from China each year and only export about $130 billion 
dollars worth of product. So that's this trade deficit that everyone's referring to. So Trump's um, mission here is obviously to close that gap. So what our view is, is that I guess the first question you need to ask is, uh, is Xi Jinping and Trump, are they motivated to get a deal done here? All right, now we know that, um, that in the US, people don't think very long term. In fact, what, what is everyone focused on in the US at the moment? The 2020 election? That's about as far as people think. And of course, so Trump wants as many wins that he, as he can get in order to support his re-election in 2020. The Chinese think out a little further and they're at an advantage because of this. So they have a 2025 industrial sponsored plan where they have articulated that they want to dominate the world in all things technology, in all things manufacturing and integrate civilian manufacturing with defence manufacturing. And this is a list of, sort of their, their target industries. Um, here just to mention a few. If anyone can tell me what deep sea space stations are, I'd be interested to know. <laughs> but this is, this is where they're headed and they're at an advantage because if you think back, if you've looked at, look at what the Chinese have decided to do in the past, they've always been a success at it. So the first thing was to be the manufacturer to the world. Most of you are probably wearing or carrying an item which has made in China, if not all of them. So they did that very well, but then the, along came the GFC, of course, and they lost all of their customers. So they decided that they would um, build large, large amounts of infrastructure. We'll talk about infrastructure in China, but it's been very hard to ignore, you know, large amounts and hundreds of airports, hundreds and thousands of toll roads, you name it. There's a whole lot of infrastructure and property build and they did that very well. They carry a lot of debt as a result of it, but they did that very well. And now this is where the future is. So what you've got is the US as the incumbent and the Chinese who are wanting to take over and challenge the US. So they stand with an advantage in some ways because they can wait Trump out. But it is at the same time, the Chinese economy is slowing. The Chinese authorities are messaging very clearly to their consumers, messages of confidence. They're throwing money at the Chinese banks to build in extra liquidity. And so we think that Xi Jinping is also motivated to do a deal. And in fact, the market thinks that a deal will be done. So that is, is uh, promising, but at the same time, in our view, it's a risk. And why is it a risk? Because if, if a deal isn't done, and that could be very damaging to share markets, and it can also be damaging to global growth, because obviously trade between these economies is fairly significant in the scheme of the world we live in. Um, so, so we think US trade, um, China trade um, deal is something to be watched, and it'll all be it'll be the devil in the detail. It's not just a matter of signing some sort of blank piece of paper to say that we're going to deal on trade. So at the moment, most of you would know there's about $2 billion worth of goods that are being imported from China to the US, um, $2 billion worth of goods with a 10% tariff. Now, that was going to be raised to 25%, but that's been put on hold whilst they're in conversations and discussions around coming to some sort of um, arrangement. And um, so the, the next big issue that I mentioned was the US monetary policy. And I, uh, this is important because where what happens to interest rates dictates what happens to the prices and the value of other assets around the world. So rising interest rates aren't great for property. Most people know that. They're not great for share markets. They're great for term deposits. They're not so great for bond markets. So the direction of interest rates is important. So up until... So earlier this year, we were expecting in the US, I'm talking here, um, for approximately three interest rate rises because we've thought that, you know, there's all the preconditions there for inflation to come through. So unemployment in the US, can anyone tell me what it is? 50-year low. Any bids? No. <laughs> About 3.7%. Historically, labour markets, you know, labour markets are very tight. So that generally then puts pressure into the inflation pipe because it's hard for employers to get workers and if they want to get, attract them, they've often got to pay more for them. So that pushes into the inflation and that means a lot of people are employed 
which means we've got money to spend, which be, builds into the demand for products and services, which pushes the prices up. So labour markets um, alone, we've seen tax cuts, we've seen very low interest rates, uh, and a number of, inf so in the US, some forecasted infrastructure and defence spending and sort of the general push. So there's preconditions for inflation. The fact is, though, inflation's not coming through. So the Fed use interest rates to manage the economy. They use it to manage inflation, manage unemployment, and they're also a very um, sensitive or more sensitive now than they ever have been to what's happening in markets. So that's meaning uh, share markets. So we'll skip... Um, script through here and have a look at what the Fed have done. And essentially, they're saying they're in a neutral position for interest rates. So I'm, we may not see any interest rates, interest rate rises in the US for the next, for this, throughout this year, even further in. Um, and they're also pulling back their quantitative tightening program, which was um, sort of the reversal of quantitative easing, which happening, happened through uh, the GFC, which essentially means that it, um, it's helping to keep some liquidity in markets and this has been favourable. Does anyone remember the share market sell-off in December, <laughs> November, December last year? 20%. It's almost totally reversed itself and back to where it is. I mean, the Aussie equity markets a couple of days ago was 30 points off a 11-year high. So this turn in direction by the Fed on interest rates is, is partially what is driving uh, share market prices. So... This is all comforting, except for the fact that they're kind of betting against history, as in the Fed is betting against history when it's saying, you know, all the preconditions for inflation are there, there's just no inflation coming. So we've just got to be mindful of those possible risks and the outcomes. So the, in our view, there's sort of three possible outcomes, but we remain cautious because some of them do, um, do inv involve downside to your capital in, in share markets. So the first is that there's no material increase in the US, and that's kind of the Goldilocks scenario. Everyone's employed, not much inflation coming through, interest rates can stay low, and share markets continue on. About 9% return is kind of what you can expect. Um, second scenario is... Um, and actually, that first scenario is a bit against history. So the second scenario is more likely, and that's what we've seen in the past, is that inflation does come through, interest rates will have to go up. Because no one's expecting interest rates to go up, what happens to equity markets? They could sell off by, you know, it's been talked about at Magellan of 20 to 30%. Now, this isn't in our high probability case. This is kind of a 20 or 30% chance, but it's still something we need to think about on your behalf. Um, and then the third scenario is that there is a recession in the US so that we do come to the end of a business cycle, and there's certainly been talk about that um, and in different indicators, whether it be manufacturing and data, so just to keep an eye on it. So that's kind of the, the three possible scenarios, um, and so I'll talk you through how we think about it and what the portfolio implications are for that in the, um, in the Magellan Global Fund to start you with. So this is a 25 stock portfolio. Um, and this is how we invest. Firstly, we've got, um, we've decreased our cash holding a little because with the Fed changing the view on interest rates, we're actually more, more comfortable with equity markets because we think the business cycle can run for a little bit longer. Um, we've increased our exposure to defensives. So when I say defensive, they're kind of, they have reliable or predictable demand. So all of us would consume or use these goods. Sort of think about your pantry, your medical kit, your cleaning cupboard, all sorts of goods which all of us consume and use each day despite what's happening around us in the, um, uh, with our jobs or the economy. So we've increased our exposure there. Um, we've reduced cyclical risk. So I mentioned we've res um, re reduced our exposure to Lloyd's. We've also reduced our exposure to Wells Fargo in the US. So banks are cyclical type of businesses. Um, so they're just a they're just a couple of examples, and we remain cautious. Is I guess the general the general message. So this is the portfolio, and I'll run you through some stock stories, which some people enjoy, just to get an insight into how these businesses operate and also how they make money. More importantly. The first thing I'll mention is that we have the cash holding and that has, that's around 15% currently. Um, then we've got, I like to describe it as two buckets of stocks. On your left is the more um, dynamic businesses, those which we think will have an advantage into the future. 
and I'll talk you through some of those. And those on your right are those that are immune to disruption or low, have low risk of being disrupted and um, therefore will pl have a place into the future but are, are less volatile. So let's talk through a couple of um, these names. So over to the top left, we've got Alphabet. Many of you may be familiar with the fact that that is the listed company of Google. So Google and Facebook have dramatically disrupted the traditional advertising industry, which was previously print media, television and radio. And now, as we know, our lives, due to the introduction of um, the internet and then the next derivative of that being mobile phones and tablets, um, we're now spending more of our time in, uh, consuming a different way. We're not reading papers as much as we used to. And um, therefore, businesses are advertising and changing their model. So if you think about Google, I'm not sure, depends on what you're interested in, but often I'll use Google as a place to research things. So I might be interested in my next, you know, a holiday in the Whit Sundays, that sounds like a good idea. Or some new running shoes, or you know, a new beach hat for my children, whatever the case is. So I'll start off at Google. Anyone else start at Google? Yep. <laughs> Apparently, uh, um, it's not a good idea to Google medical conditions, all right? <laughs> But aside from that, I think Dr. Lenter, you'll agree with me there. <laughs> um, but aside from that, you know, your general research, whether it be, you know, harmless things, starts now. Now, what happens once you Google? So, let's say ASICS running shoes. What happens in the search screen? See a few banners, you know, highlighted ads. So, they've paid for those particular ads. So, that's Google ad, word, um, ad profiles. But then you get a whole pa like pages and pages, don't you, of results. Okay, so how does Google make money on this? Once I click on one of those search results, Google then collects revenue on a, um, a click per ad model. So what this does, it opens up the world to a whole lot of smaller brands entering into the market and, and does and has disrupted a lot of the incumbent brands. So big businesses like um, Colgate Palmolive or uh, Procter & Gamble, big US businesses which have a whole range of products, they, only, they had the monopoly because they, they were the only ones who could afford television advertising. Whereas now smaller businesses are able to do scaled advertising and, and leverage off that opportunity. So it's changing the industry as we know it. So Google will make money from ad clicks and the searches that we do and often we'll also go through and proceed with transactions. Um, the other advertising platform, of course, is Facebook, which is, you know, big, started off as a social media platform but now is filled with advertisements. Um, and and, and th both of those businesses, probably more particularly Facebook's faced a lot of media attention of late. Part of that media attention is, of course, because... Facebook has disrupted traditional media and the media industry doesn't like them. So, if you can find me any good in um, media articles that support Facebook, I'd be entertained because they're obviously um, not so happy with Facebook taking away and destroying the industry that they, that they had. So, there, there are a couple of, um, a couple of the, the stocks that are in the technology winner space. I'll talk to you about Apple shortly. Um, Visa and MasterCard, the move to cashless society, you've probably heard that. Um, and experiencing it yourself, whether you're paying with cash and cheque versus whether you're actually tapping or paying with your credit card each time you make a transaction, Visa or MasterCard, depends on who the issuer of your card is, will receive a small clip of the amount of the transaction. So as this cashless society spreads through the world, it's a large thematic of the amount of sort of addressable universe that um, they can collect payments on. And you've got businesses like Microsoft and SAP and Oracle. SP and Oracle do a lot of the security and fraud work um, that was talked about by the Macquarie guys. Uh, and, now, and then just over to the low risk of disruption. These are businesses which we think have a nice, um, are defensive essentially and have less likely, less 
are less likely to be disrupted. So there's a couple of businesses here. I'll step you through Crown Castles later. That's an infrastructure stock, but it sits in the Global Fund as well. Um, and we'll talk through uh, Starbucks. Yum Brands is KFC, Pizza Hut and Taco Bell. Um, HCA is like a Ramsey hospital business, but in the US, largest hospital, um, private hospital chain in the US. Lowe's, anyone been to US and been into a Lowe's store or a Home Depot store? So it's a similar to a Bunnings of the US, but about 30 times the size. <laughs> Um, and so these, we're actually reducing our exposure to Lowe's um, and, as I mentioned, Wells Fargo because they have it, they're, they've cut, had a very um, strong cycle post the GFC and with the housing market recovery. So they've achieved what we wanted to. So let's just quickly take a look at um, a couple of stocks. I'll just talk you through the business of Apple. This next slide shows how quickly technology has been a adopted um, or how quickly new innovations are adopted over time and how long it takes for a particular um, innovation to attract 50 million users. And you can see electricity, it was 46 years to get 50 million users. And then you go up the slides and you see slowly it's getting faster and faster and faster. And it's eventually smartphones, it's taken four years for, them to, for there to be 50 million users. And there's a lot more than that. Um, now, but this was how long it took. Now, we know that Apple was the sort of one of the iPhone was sort of the first entry or the first successful entry into the iPhone market. And that business now has, um, has changed in its nature because previously, if you look back five or six years ago on the left-hand side, you see that this business was dependent on attracting new clients. So, it had an existing user base and I might be buying a new iPhone because I wanted to upgrade my current phone. But then it was looking at attracting, also attracting new clients to their model. So moving off, remember the old phones? Phones that just used to ring? <laughs> Nokia, Blackberries, Motorola's, come on, there must be more. So they're all in the graveyard of mobile phone businesses that way. And now we have the smartphone businesses and these obviously allow us to do a lot more. But Apple now has a very strong established client base. It's got the most loyal client base on any com company on the planet. And it has, and it, but however, it still has a growth pro profile where it's also attracting new clients. So let's have a look at what else is happening under the bonnet of Apple. And this is where the, we think the hidden value is because most of us now are connected to our um, phones uh, and connected almost constantly. Uh, and so therefore, we are involved in the Apple ecosystem. Some of us would also have iPads, some of us would have Apple TV, a MacBook, an iMac. But the other part of the business now is wearables. So any of you got an Apple Watch? Any of your family got an Apple Watch? <laughs> Okay, so they've got growth of 50% year on year for the Apple Watch and the AirPod, AirPods, which people obviously are wireless um, headphones. So that part of the business is growing very strong. And then we have the services part. So this is where you're, you know, installing apps, you're buying music, you're subscribing to protection, insurance protection for your products. Um, you're hooked up to um, iCloud because you've got all your 8,000 photos you want backed up somewhere else. So this, these are subscription-based products generally. And once you're in, you're in. It's very hard to get out, I'll tell you. <laughs> so this business, these uh, collectively, if you look at this business, it's worth 250 billion market cap US. So if you uh, compare that to say Woolworths in Australia, that's about 31 billion US or BHP, which is about 135. So in its own right, um, these two businesses would be a top 20 business in the world. And by far, I find this quite interesting, Apple, by revenues, is the largest watchmaker on the planet. So who would have thought? So this is disruption, as we see it in our front of us, in our faces. Um, just in the interest of time, I'm going to skip through the Starbucks um, story. But essentially, Starbucks is... A, um, the world's largest coffee business. Some of the st statistics are fascinating. There's 30,000 cafes in the US and Canada and across Europe and Japan. You can't get away from them. 
haven't had, hasn't had such a success story in Australia. But essentially, if anyone has a Nespresso coffee machine with the pods, Starbucks supply the coffee that goes in the coffee pods. So they have both a cafe business, then they have a commercial business that supplies to other coffee um, coffee businesses, so to speak, or providers of coffee products. And then they have what we like, which is a growing uh, business in China. Now, we know that the, cons the middle class is doubling, um, over, up until, so the doubling middle class up until 2022, so there'll be 600 million, which is the, nearly the total population of the US. This is the middle class in China. Um, and at the moment, they only drink one cup of coffee a, a year in China per capita. Whereas in, in America, they're all addicted, of course, and they're drinking about 300 cups. So we think it's it, the business model, we say coffee is habitual. The truth is coffee is addictive. And once you start to, in, you know, dip your toe in the coffee culture, it's hard to get out of it. So the, this, this in Starbucks is opening a store every 16 hours in China. So when you travel to China through one of their hundreds of airports, uh, keep a look out for a Starbucks. I'll just quickly cover this. Essentially, this is the performance of the Global Fund. The red bar is what's, in my view, important. That's how much downside we've captured over different time periods. And so since um, sort of from 7 to 10 to any, over any time period, we've, we're capturing a lot less than the market. So what you'll see Koshi report on on the news is, of course, the index. Let's just pretend he's talking about the global index, so the S&P 500 or the MISCI. Um, and the index will give you 100% of the upside, which is the blue chart, the blue bars here. And it'll also give you 100% of the downside. So in the Magellan Global Fund, we're wanting to smooth that ride. We'll give you 100% of the upside. Generally, that's been, if the track record's anything to rely on, which I know you're not meant to always do that. So take that with caution and Olivia and Stephen look after that. Um, but we'll only give you sort of 50% of the downside, and that's how we get superior returns um, over time. But the performance is, can be skipped through. So let's just do a quick chat about infrastructure. So investing in infrastructure, all of us know that infrastructure um, are, are assets we can invest in, and they're essential for the running of a community. Okay, so that means demand is predictable. So let's talk through the types of infrastructure assets you can invest in. What do people, most people think about when I say infrastructure? Yeah, toll roads, bridges, anything that blows up in a Hollywood movie, right? <laughs> so um, there's a lot more to it. So let's just have a quick look down here. Firstly, so over to your left, you've got the list of the utility businesses that you can invest in. Essentially, regardless of whether I have a job, so they're... Uh, these guys are very defensive um, because regardless of whether I, I have a job, hopefully I wake up in the morning, I turn on the water, I wash my hands and face, I then turn on the heater if it's cold, the air conditioner or the fan if it's hot, um, I flush the toilet, I have a shower, I do all of my day-to-day -day things. So this is what utilities are for. The In the middle, um, in the middle column is all the transport infrastructure. So this is more sensitive to economic conditions, still reasonably reliable. If you look over time, airport traffic numbers continue to rise because the cost of flying is cheaper and most of us the, across the world generally, people are getting wealthier. And so therefore you have airports as one means of transport. Um, how do airports make money? Well, they get aeronautical fees. How else do they make money? Car parking? And retail. Great. So they've got... Now, you will notice that all US airports are not privately owned. They're run by the government. And generally, it takes a lot longer to travel through a US airport than it does anywhere else in the world. So other airports that you can invest in... Brisbane is actually a privately owned one, so it's not listed. But, you know, you've got Auckland Airport, um, Zurich Airport, Charles de Gaulle. You know, there's a whole range of European, Australian, New Zealand um, airports. Um, toll roads, that's all around, you know, population growth and demand for cars, and we'll talk about China shortly. Pipelines, communication towers, which is around the use, increase of data that people are using, and therefore the 
um, demand and the need for telecommunications equipment to be on towers so that you and I can look at photos and watch videos and do different things with the um, phone. Ports and rail to move goods and so on. And then there's social infrastructure, which is only really 1% of what we can invest in at Magellan. So we take it another level and we want to take out um, anything that's got a lot of competition. So that gives you an example. We don't invest in energy retailing. So AGL and Origin, for example, we don't think they're investable. And that's just because competition's great for consumers, but what's it not great for? Investors. Okay, it erodes away profit. So um, we stay out of that. We don't like anything that's got commodity price movements, and we, we also want to avoid sovereign risks. I'm going to step you through um, China quickly and the toll road phenomenon. So we, I mentioned earlier, China has had a huge infrastructure development um, that's gone on. It's very hard to ignore, and it's also been very difficult to decide not to invest there. But here are some of the reasons why. Firstly, we when you're investing in infrastructure, you're looking after an asset for a very long period of time. So you want to make sure that the way they're regulated um, is fair and also um, the contracts are upheld. What's happened in China, so you can see here the Zhengzhou um, Expressway. Um, there was a call by the Chinese government back in 20, 2010 to ensure that all agricultural trucks that were transporting any sort of produce didn't pay a toll. You can imagine the amount of trucks and, and vehicles that would go through. So that was the first decision that was made. Now, that was a break of contract. So the Chinese government against the um, operators of this toll road. But do you think they had any protection? So the judiciary system and the government are all one in the same. So try to have a case against the Chinese government. In China, you don't have much luck. Different to here, if it was transurban, they would have been protected quite strongly. Um, then, so that was the first situation. And then the second was that they had subsequent public holidays and um, they just, the Chinese government again decided that you, they wouldn't charge tolls. Now, these are the, the largest travel days because people are going back to their hometowns in China and they extended that eight-day period out to 20 days and then they allowed for a new toll road operator because the roads are congested um, to open and it erodes away the profitability of these toll roads into China. So... This is an example of why we don't invest in Chinese infrastructure because you're not protected. There's no um, reimbursement, so to speak, if the, if the rules change. And this is how you see what happens to the share price in comparison to, say, CityLink that sits in, in Melbourne. I've got one minute, so I'm going to be very quick. And this is why we don't have exposure to commodity-exposed infrastructure stocks. Um, so these are two large infrastructure businesses well, that other um, that people on the market would consider to be infrastructure stocks, but they're oil pipelines. Now you can see what happens here into the oil price. So it falls from $107 a barrel to $26 a barrel through 2015. And what has happened to the actual share prices of these businesses? So they fall exactly in line with the oil price. So we are not prepared to take that risk on your behalf and have that volati volatility in your portfolios. So we strip out a whole lot of oil and gas pipelines unless they have contracts which are based on um, volume rather than price because this price sensitivity comes on through. Um, so here's a little... Here's some... Um, this is gonna, I'm just going to introduce you to the stock called Crown Castle, which actually happens to be in our global fund as well as in our infrastructure fund. And this is all around the use of data. So if you think about the use of iPhones and all of us are using large amounts of data. In fact, in the US, I find this quite interesting, people have got, at, at 2017, they've got eight connected, Wi-Fi connected devices and they expect that that's going to grow to about 13. So I was sitting at home thinking... Eight. This is per capita. I mean, what have people got? But then I had a look at what they are. So it's your phone. It's potentially a watch. It'll be a remote control on a on a uh, for a TV. It'll be your GPS in your car. It'll be your old nav van that you still have. Um, there's a whole lot of connected devices. It'll be the iPad. It'll be your computer. It'll be your wireless mouse and your wireless keyboard, etc. But that is growing 
and um, quite rapidly, and there'll be 4 billion connected um, devices by 2022 in the US alone. So where's all this data come from? So because of the connectivity of these devices, we're now using the data and we're watching things like and scrolling through. As you know, often people think, well, how does that actually come up on my phone? So you're scrolling through Facebook and watching videos and seeing movies, watching streaming TV through Netflix, um, navigating through Google Maps, and also watching um, videos on YouTube. So this all requires data. So you need the telecommunications com companies to make the streaming or the high frequency um, spectrum available to you. So it, it, you've screen doesn't just surl and um, cycle around. So this is where a Crown Castles comes into place. They are a uh, tower communications business and they have, their tenants are the telecommunications businesses. So AT&T, Verizon, you name it, in here, in Australia. Actually, Crown Castles used to own towers in Australia. They're now owned by Macquarie, I believe. Um, and they hold the, the um, equipment for you know, Telstra, Vodafone, etc. Optus. And so this is the different types of um, cells that you see. I'm seeing more and more of the small cells, which are kind of on top of lamp posts and on bus stops, etc. And this allows data to be communicated in high frequency. And this is the network that Crown Castles have. And many of you would know there's a um, sort of a general, it's called the not in my backyard. Um, trend or NIMBY, a NIMBYism, and people don't want these sorts of towers in their backyards. It's very hard to um, continue to have them pop up everywhere. So that, that sort of summarises my presentation, so I will be around for questions um, later on. This is the, the performance of the infrastructure fund. Some of you just may like to, you know, may be pleased to see that we've certainly achieved the objective of 8%. Um, over a long time, just like we have with the Global Fund. But essentially, um, I guess in summary, we remain cautious about equity markets from here. We're keeping an eye on what's happening with the US in terms of trade and what's happening with the Fed. But I think the, the message here is that we're thinking out three to five years. Some um, investors or traders will be looking out three to five months or some, in some cases, three to five minutes. So we're taking a longer term view and investing in businesses that we think have got good structural opportunities where they're disrupting an industry, they're creating that disruption, or they're actually immune to that disruption. So um, I'm hoping that gives you a bit of an insight into what we do at Magellan and I look forward to meeting you at the break. Thank you. Thanks, Nicole. You're welcome. I've got Olivia here to give a vote of thanks. Um, and I've also got a small gift for you as well. Terrific. Um, it's unusual for investors to get face-to-face -face time with fund managers. Um, they usually are very busy and um, so I think we really appreciate the fact that, Nicole, you've come along today. You've told us a lot about um, what's happening around the world as well, but also sort of delved into some of the, the specific stocks that um, you hold and the reasons why for that as well. So just a big round of applause uh, and thank you, Nicole.